Hello there, Christy. Um, so we were talking about the non-hero quest, which is what I would like to talk about. But of course, in order to talk about the non-hero quest, you have to talk about the hero quest. We're pretty familiar, I think, all of us with the hero quest, even if we don't know it by that name. Um, it's the hero quest, the hero's journey is Joseph Campbell, it's Star Wars. Um, it, you can look it up, it features a bunch of things, you know, like the call to adventure, um, the descent into the abyss, the magic item, kind of all the things that we're uh, very familiar with from a lot of narratives that we've seen, linear narratives. Um, and so there can be this inclination when you're making a game um, where you just go, I have the perfect narrative skeleton and that is the hero quest because I want to have things be kind of linear. I want to have this is your destiny. I want to have these sorts of characters that kind of appear, these supporting characters. And there, there are kind of a whole bunch of reasons I could go on and on. Um, boss fights. You have to have boss fights. I mean, that's a hero quest thing. Um, and also it has a nice ending, you know, the quest is over, Blah, you know, big celebration. Um, and so you can see your creative challenge as a game maker as really being um, to hang some fresh meat on a very tried and true skeleton, story skeleton. Um, and I want to kind of argue that the universe is bigger than that, I guess. I want to put in a pitch for um, non-hero quests, for non-hero journeys. Um, so when I think about games, I, I think it's important to realize that there are three game narratives, actually. We've been talking about the intended narrative, which is what the game designer develops, right? It's a narrative you intend for the player to experience. But there's another one, which is the experience narrative, which is the player's actual journey. So, you know, there's your intended narrative, but then there are their reactions to it. So they fail a whole bunch of times someplace, so they're feeling bad, you know? They wish that they could have solved the problem you presented some other way. Um, you know, but you didn't, you didn't allow that, or maybe you did. Um, and then it, it includes all of these reactions that they have. Yeah. And uh, that's also, to, and that's also why we do testing to try and get those two together, you know, exactly. Play. Yeah. Yeah. But, but of course there's always going to be reactions, right. That you don't anticipate or you can't support you. There are just limits to it, um, et cetera. And it, it's not that like the experience narrative is something to be feared. It's just something that you need to recognize actually exists. And it's different from the intended narrative. Um, and I think the one thing about the experience narrative that means the most to me is just that those moments when as a player you say, I can see that the game is trying to make me feel this way, but I don't. So... And then the third narrative is the player narrative, which is the story that the player tells themselves about themselves and the game. So at the end, you, you have a reaction, you know, maybe you say, huh, that, or that was cool. Or maybe you say, wow, that was really thought provoking. Um, so did your game actually make a difference in the player's life or did it just kind of fill them an amount of time and now they're on to something else? So this is really the question about your game as art, because art makes a difference. Um, and so this is really kind of why I want to speak, especially, I guess, to people who intend their games to be art um, or to make a positive difference. Because I kind of, through my own journey, um, came to consider the player narrative as being essentially the most important narrative of the three. So I need to back up a second and just talk about important narratives. Because if I ask you, oh, what are important narratives in your life? You know, you may say, well, Harry Potter. I mean, these are things I really felt. You know, Wonder Woman, uh, Sailor Moon, you know. Um, but, you know, you can ask that question in a different way and get an entirely different answer, which is you'll tell a story about you and your friend or you and your spouse or you and this guy on the subway you know, these kind of real life stories. So it's like commercial stories versus personal stories. And that really maps to kind of the hero quest as opposed to the non-hero uh, journey that I'll be talking about. And of course, you know, the, the commercial stories have big budgets, they got CGI, they have top talent, 
your personal stories don't, you know, they got no budget, there's no CGI, um, you know, they don't have an arc, you know, they're kind of really weird, but yet they're your stories and commercial stories in the end really aren't. You know, you can project yourself into them, but in the end, that's not actually your story. It's your story only as far as you actually embrace it. So personal stories are better at changing you because you're in them. They are effortlessly representational. And so, you know, that is part of why I make games where the player narrative is first, because those are yours. That's my story as a player, right? So, so now let's talk about the non-hero heroes. Um, so in real life, the hero journey, so in real life, we're talking about real life now, um, the hero journey is nothing like the Campbellian hero journey, right? It's kind of almost entirely the inverse. Uh, you call yourself to action, nobody helps you, you don't go anywhere, um, you work with other people, you don't do it alone. Um, you aren't that different from, you're not special in any way, you know, I mean, um, and oftentimes victories are these little tiny, you can miss them. You know, they're not like these big moments where you just go, oh, that was great. Instead, they're these moments where you just kind of go, oh, okay, well, actually that worked out. And, you know, wow, you know, okay, we're, we got together, we made this thing, you know, we fixed this thing or whatever happens, right? So, you know, I, I've lived in, uh, in my neighborhoods, I see a lot of, these sorts of hero narratives played out. Who is the hero of your neighborhood? You know, it's the guy who picks up the garbage every week. You know, I mean, he's just the hero of the neighborhood. He makes this huge difference, but it's this kind of plodding progress where there's less and less garbage in your neighborhood. If you're, you happen to live in a garbage strewn neighborhood, which I did at one time. So, so now it's kind of interesting because I see this sort of narrative creep in this sort of really weird way into mainstream media stories, um, contemporary ones. So in a weird way, Game of Thrones or Walking Dead are kind of examples where you don't actually have a hero in the way that you used to. Everyone's flawed. Everyone has their own agenda. They need to work together or they should, but it's really messy. I mean, you know, and, and so and it, it's kind of endless, you know, especially Game of Thrones. Um, you know, so it's this kind of story about these people with histories and baggage and they're imperfect, but they must work together in some way. They must hammer out some sort of agreement. Um, and so that's kind of an example of a sort of different, the non-hero um, journey kind of creeping into even the stuff which is consumed in the mainstream. Um, and then another example that I'll mention just about um, a non-hero, a game with non-hero hero heroes is a game that I put together. Uh, so my team and I did a game called World Without Oil. And a brief summary of the game, we kind of created this magic circle. Inside the magic circle, we pretended that a global oil crisis had started. The, the game runner characters were not experts or anything. They were just citizens. And so they just said, we citizens need to pull together. Please send us your stories. We'll tell you our stories. All of these stories together, we'll have some idea of what's going on in this global crisis. And so people played this game. They pretended that they were in an oil crisis. They thought of what their lives would be like. They wrote these stories and, or they video, made little videos and they sent them in about how their lives were going. And so it was this very interesting experiment in this sort of collaborative story making. You know, but again, there's no real hero there. Um, they're just kind of all of these people, you know, and, and it's not one narrative. It's multi-threaded. There are all of these narratives kind of going on at the same time. So it's very interesting because it's a, kind of a lot like real life, I guess. Yeah. So, and I guess the other thing to say about World Without Oil is just that it was really impactful for some some players. I mean, they really felt it. It was really a meaningful narrative to them. It's interesting. So, um, like World Without Oil was an alternate reality game, you know, or, you know, it's, it's, it's in that, that, uh, that genre, that, that, that format, yeah. and, um, which is designed, you know, to exist in the player's world. Um, and so having those 
realistic elements, you know, was, was part of it. But what you're saying is, um, you know, that we're, we're seeing it outside of works that are trying to mimic reality. You know, we're seeing, you know, the rise of ensemble, um, um, you know, works and, and all of that in any media form. Um, yeah, so there's a cultural shift that's actually going on. Yeah, I, well, I, I would um, hesitate to kind of be perhaps that strong, but I think that there's a useful momentum building. And of course, there's, there are, you know, you kind of bring up the larger picture. And so I think that there is a realization going on, and I'm just talking about now research in other areas where, you know, we've kind of developed this cult of the individual. And of course, this is the American point of view. And I mean, it's kind of brought on our particular political problem of the moment, really, is kind of this idea that you have a hero, quote unquote, and there's only, you know, only one person who can fix your problem. But no, as it turns out, progress is made by a bunch of people kind of plodding away at stuff. I mean, we're kind of learning that um, in kind of the worst possible way right now in the U.S. So, so yeah, so... Again, when you're thinking about when your audience, you know, when you audience members, when you intangible people um, are thinking about making a game that makes a difference, you know, I think that it's important to kind of think about the non-hero ideas. Because like I said, there's kind of this sort of thing where you just go, well, it's one player. And so you give them one persona and you make that persona special because then the player feels special. Yeah, and then if you if you're giving them structures and behaviors and thought processes and and tasks that they can actually do in the real world, you know, not not you know not not necessarily you know completely realistic. You can still have fantasy, but you're modeling systems and behavior that yeah that that, that actually work in the you know in the in the in the real world. Then you're more likely to have a transformative effect, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And, and for me, it's really a big, it's a big deal about what your play actually is. So, you know, for example, if we're talking about like a, like a real time strategy game, you know, a lot of those games have you essentially get resources, make something from it, get more resources, make something more. It's this non sustainable model of play. You know, some of them are quite literal, right? Where you actually go get wood by chopping down a forest. And at the end of the forest, you might have won the game, but you've like completely wiped out your forest. You know, it's like you have that fear a moment at the end of the game because you don't have to live in the world that you've now created, you know? So, so I think that it's important that the gameplay not have that sort of arc either. If you're really talking about one of the messages that you want to do, to, you know, is to be sustainable, you know, to be collaborative, you kind of need to have collaboration in your game. I mean, to really embody the messages, um, you know, so, so yeah, that's, that is kind of the end message, I think, that I wanted to, to make. I mean, you've really summed it up uh, very well, which is, you know, the, the hero quest doesn't necessarily map to the sorts of difference that, you know, that I want to make in the world. I mean, that's the reason World Without Oil got made, right? Is because I kind of said, I want to try out a different type of gameplay. Um, I want to create it, I want to make this happen, I want to test this out. Um, so, you know, kind of let your gameplay be the change you want to see in the world. You know, kind of walk the walk among your own beliefs, um, I guess. Because it's, those beliefs are discernible in a game. I mean, you know, it, it's been said, right, that game is really good at learning something about a player, but it's really, really good at learning something about the people who made it, you know? And so, and boy, we could go on and on about that. But um, yeah, so that's, that's my message, the non-hero journey. Yeah, 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 excellent. So what would you advise then when you know, for someone to start applying these ideas uh, to their own projects, you know, what, what, what could be a, a, an, an approach that they could use to, to help change well, their thinking? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, to be very player oriented. So to think about the player experience. And so 
what is the player actually doing? What is your actual gameplay? You know, if it's very alone and you're encouraging collaboration, you know, is there a way that you can kind of try to break that mold? You know, you've kind of been, there are circumstances that are trying to funnel you into that. Can you resist that? Is there a way that you can rethink the game that, in, that encourages collaboration? And a lot of times that takes people down routes that they're not really comfortable with. So, you know, if you're, if you're doing a single player game and you want to have a lot of collaboration, it means creating kind of all of these very rich, NPCs and interaction with NPCs, kind of an equal sort of relationship where maybe the NPCs actually have more power than the players and how uncomfortable does that feel? But that might be what you need to do in order to get the sort of gameplay where you just go, this is what I'm talking about. This, this sort of collaboration is what I, you know, what I want to do. And, and to kind of script and, you know, I mean, NPCs are kind of famous for being these sorts of characters that, in the end, don't really push back to you at all. I mean, I, we used to call them doormat characters when I was in the industry. They're just a doormat that kind of you wipe your feet on you on your way through a doorway to something else, you know, and to some, some aspect of the story. And so, you know, can you be the one who kind of creates these non-doormat NPCs? There's an awful lot of AI out there now, you know, that you can begin to rely on in terms of how does your interface work and all of those sorts of problems. Um, so there are there are all sorts of imaginative mm. ideas, and there's all sorts of technology that can help you. But you have to understand that you have a problem before yeah. you begin to invoke those things. Yeah. So if you're if you're planning out uh, the the arc, the journey, in in some way, um, yeah, people people are thinking in terms of okay, okay, I've got a single person, um, but a way to break out of that is actually maybe you've got an ensemble or maybe you've got a buddy adventure. You know, you, you know th th think about more than one as a first step, it sounds like. Um, and yes. then, yeah, and then, yeah, what, you know, what, what possibly are they aiming for? Um, you know, you mentioned that in real life, you do the call to adventure yourself. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So there are a number of, of things about the hero journey. And again, you know, that the inverse is true for the, the non-hero journey. And so one of the things about the hero journey is the universe really revolves around you as the hero. So it's like, you know, the universe poses a question and then the universe sits and waits for you to answer the question. And so to get away from that, you know, where, you you can certainly create a game where essentially things just move on. You know, you have a chance to kind of, so you can have a chance to influence the world, but it's already got its own momentum. People are going to kind of do what they're going to do. I mean, again, kind of looking at the real world, if you want people to be better at operating in the real world, you know, that's, this is an important way to kind of give them lessons on how to do that, you know? And so part of that is just exactly what you were talking about, this idea that, you can make a game where stuff happens. And part of the challenge of the game is knowing when you should kind of interject yourself into it and when you should just let stuff go to just go, no, it's working. It's working. You know, I should just let this be, you know, I don't have to just be sitting here. This isn't a click farm. I don't have to click on every little thing. You know, those sorts of, those sorts of ideas are really fun for yeah. me to play with. I like, so, I like that. Yeah. I like that idea of there being multiple entry points, like multiple points in which they could basically decide to start the journey. It's, it's not that one point where everything in the game is sort of cycling and treading water until you actually do it sort of thing. It's like, you know, things are happening, you know, and you could, you could choose to, to it's like, I'm going to do this now or, but, you know, oh no, I'll let other people do that, which, which as you say, takes it out of you being the center of the universe. There's other people in this game that are going to take care of it. What do I want to be doing? Yes. So, so another thing I think, which is interesting in games, which is an aspect of the hero journey, uh, a manifestation of it is the idea of perfect information. You know, you have your heads up display and it tells you exactly what's going on. You know, this is how much life you have left. This is, you know, it tells you all that sort of thing. But in the real world, guess what? You never have perfect information. You know, it's, it's always, it's like, 
I thought I put five clips of ammo in my bag, but one fell out. I didn't notice. I only have four, you know, not that I want to go, you know, to these sorts of warlike things, right? But operating with imperfect information to just make that a feature of the game rather than the sort of, you know, so, so there is a, you know, there's so much of gameplay, which is kind of baked in by the hero quest, which is why I said it's kind of everywhere. You run into it all the time. And so your game possibly can get really interesting when you start questioning those assumptions. Um, you know, when you're really just going to say, you know what, I'm not taking this whole kit. I'm going to take this and this and this, but I'm not going to do that. And I'm not going to do that. What kind of game do I got? What sort of play have I got? You know, and again, are players being intrigued by this? Are they learning the sorts of things that they want to learn? You know, is this time being valuable? Is this mapping to some sort of cognitive thing where you just go, this is going to make me a better person in the end, so I'm going to keep playing. Mm. Yeah, so you could, um, in, in some ways, take the hero's journey and say, okay, what if I do the inverse of this at this point? Or what are all the alternatives to, to you know, what is being supplied here? And then just rethink your game at all of those points as, a, as an anti-spine, in a way. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there's... Uh, 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 oblique strategies, the Brian Eno card deck or whatever, a lot of those sorts of things. You know, you might just lay out all of the assumptions that you're taking and then just start f flopping oblique strategies cards onto them just to see where that goes. To, I think to get a good healthy questioning about the game format um, going on. Um, and I'll just kind of throw back to World Without Oil again. You know, one of the things about it was it didn't have any sort of preset idea about what was going to happen in the oil crisis. It really just kind of started the question and it created space for people to supply their own answers, you know, based on information from their own lives. And so, again, with the player narrative in mind, you don't have to tell anything. You know, so many good linear narratives kind of leave these questions that the audience member has to answer for themselves, you know, kind of using their own knowledge. And so that's another part, I think, of, you know, the um, withholding of information um, idea is leave space for the player to kind of come up with their own answer to things. Really be question-oriented rather than answer-oriented all the time. Lovely. Thank you so much, Ken, for your time. Sure. <laughs> You're quite welcome. <laughs>